Chapter 2 Jackson wasn't sure what Katie's hours of work were at the daycare, so he just put her bag in his truck and drove to town the next morning. First order of business in his mind was to find her keys. Today he wore coveralls and rubber boots. He was prepared to sift through the entire dumpster if necessary. It wasn't the first dirty job he had done, nor would it be the last. Good thing farm life had prepared him for dealing with all sorts of noxious odors. He thought about the timing of Katie's pregnancy, if she was pregnant. Trent had been home during the last part of summer. He wondered if his brother and Katie had been romantically involved. Trent had never said anything, nor was there any indication that the two were anything but good friends. Jackson knew his mom would be thrilled if Katie and Trent were a couple. It was something she had always not so secretly hoped for. When he got to the dumpster, Jackson took out his work gloves, a bucket, and a stack of garbage bags. Before he went in, he double-checked his emails from his cell phone, putting off the moment. There was one from his agent. Jackson had been working hard to try to make the farm pay since the passing of his father eight years prior. The truth was, the farm wasn't paying. It was barely breaking even, and that was because they were mortgage-free. If they had a mortgage on the place, there was no way he would have been able to pay for Trent and their sister Stacy's schooling, their operating loans, plus the cost of running the place. Utilities alone put a huge dent in the monthly budget, never mind the cost of feed for the animals, veterinary bills, equipment upkeep. The list of expenses were endless, while the income stream limited. Actually, it was a separate form of income from the farm that had made everything possible. An income that Jackson kept secret from his family, friends, and community. Seven years ago, Jackson had responded to a dare from a friend. They had been joking about how the books they had read lately weren't all that good. Both had egged each other on to enter a contest from a big city paper to see if they could do better than other authors. Jackson had written a novel and entered it in the open submission call. He found out later that his friend had reneged on the dare, meaning that Jackson had won a full case of beer. Jackson used a pen name, and surprisingly, an agent had responded, tearing the book to pieces and ordering him to rewrite it. He had told his friend that he had never gotten a reply from the contest organizers. Jackson had ignored the rejected submission for four months. Then, surprising himself... He had gotten an urge and rewrote it, making some of the suggestions the agent demanded, while changing other things as he liked. When he sent it in again, the agent, one Andrea Schultz, had made a few more changes, but otherwise she loved it. She took him on, publishing the book with her company. He talked to the accounting part of the firm and managed to get the royalties paid in his name. It was the beginning of a seven-year career of writing under the pen name J.D. Emerson. Now it was a desperately needed income that had probably saved them from having to mortgage the farm and eventually sliding into bankruptcy like so many others in the area. There was one snag, though. Everyone assumed J.D. Emerson was a woman, and Jackson had no intention of telling them otherwise because he wrote romance novels the cheesy kind that so many women read, the kind that were a little embarrassing to be caught in the hands of a man. Jackson was proud of his work in a private, please don't let anyone else know way. He could imagine the ribbing and teasing he would get from members of the male community if word got out. Jackson Davis, member of the 4-H club, on the board of the Cattlemen's Association, part of the Good Farmers Group, a man who played baseball in the summer, worked hard, and was a man of the community, writing fluffy romance novels. It didn't bear thinking about. He would be the laughingstock of the town. When he read the latest email from Andrea, he dropped his bucket, ignoring it as it rolled a little piece away. She wanted him to take a book tour, to travel the country, do readings, talk to readers, and sign books. She had a prime-time spot booked on a famous woman's talk show. Andrea said it could propel him nationwide from making thousands every few weeks to tens of thousands with the publicity. She sounded excited. It could be the making of both their careers. A pit formed in Jackson's stomach. 
This could not happen. He could not go on national television or up in front of a bunch of ladies saying he was J.D. Emerson. It would get back to Pendle, and life would never be the same. He was not going to be the butt of everyone's jokes in the small community. Jackson shoved the phone into his pocket and grabbed the bucket. He had a job to do. He would think about Andrea's proposition later. There had to be a way to get out of it. It took him two hours of sorting out bags and going through the loose goop of rotten vegetables and fruit. Finally, he found a pair of keys, and he dearly hoped they were Katie's. He wiped them off as best as he could with paper towels. Just to be sure, he went to the rusty hatchback and tried to unlock it with success. Perfect. Jackson locked the car again. Not that he had any faith that a thief would so much as give it a second glance. It looked like a death trap. He wondered if the frame was rotting out. Tapping his boot against the frame, a cloud of rusty dust came up, making him cough. How the car still functioned was beyond him. Stripping off his coveralls, Jackson put the offending smelling garment in the back of the truck with his supplies. He switched out his boots, tossing them and the gloves into the bucket, and setting them in the truck bed. He knew he didn't smell too fresh, but at least he looked presentable. Jackson stopped at Katie's apartment first. In daylight, the buildings looked worse than when he had dropped her off last night. A rain gutter was detached, one end on the lawn, the other still attached partway to one of the townhouse roofs. Paint was peeling. A piece of vinyl siding was missing, showing off the insulation underneath. The plants were overgrown. Grimacing, Jackson parked on the street and went up to Katie's door. He rang the bell, then decided to knock as well, since he really didn't know if the bell even worked. No one answered. Figuring she was at work, he went back to his truck and drove to the daycare next. Ginny Halstrom greeted him at the waiting area. Good day, Mrs. Halstrom. Jackson took care to be particularly polite. Ginny was known to gossip, and it didn't do to get on her bad side. I have a couple of items for Miss Sutton. Isn't that nice of you? Ginny smiled with interest. I'll just take them to her. Ma'am, I would appreciate it if I could just talk to Katie a moment. Jackson smiled in return, and didn't make any move to hand over the keys or the bag. He had double-bagged Katie's items to keep them private for her, and didn't want Ginny snooping through them to see the pregnancy test. Of course, Ginny paused for a moment, but widened her smile as she silently acknowledged that she wasn't going to get any information from him. She would probably be badgering Katie later. Did you hear about the Hawkins factory? Jackson frowned. Normally, he didn't like listening to gossip. However, he could see that Ginny was practically bursting to say what was on her mind. What about it? They have closed. Yesterday, everyone got their walking papers. The bank has seized the property. Ginny's eyes gleamed as she leaned forward. Owen Hawkins gave out bonuses and references with the last paychecks, but no severance packages. Brant said they couldn't afford any severances, but people are wondering. That family has always been one of the richest and leaders in this community. It seems a little odd, and people deserve their severance packages. I didn't know that. Jackson gave a truthful answer without committing himself to comment on the matter of money between employer and employees. He was friends with Brant and would talk to him later. Would you mind getting Katie, please? Certainly. Ginny nodded and continued talking. I heard that some people are thinking of getting together a class suit against the company to get the money they're owed. Something like this will be the death of this town. All those people out of work and no jobs available. I'm glad I'm near retirement age and my husband has his pension. Otherwise, we would have to move away from Pendle like so many others will. It's a shame this has happened. You are very lucky, Jackson agreed. I have chores waiting on me at home. Could I speak to Katie? Sure you can, tittered Ginny. Why didn't you just ask? Jackson bit his tongue as he watched her head back into the daycare. Shaking his head in disbelief at Ginny's antics, he looked at the colorful and somewhat confusing artwork of the toddlers taped to the wall. For a moment, he wondered what it would be like to have kids. 
he supposed it would make life a lot less quiet. It wasn't that he didn't like kids. He just didn't have that much experience with them beyond his own brother and sister. Jackson? Katie closed the door behind her as she came into the waiting room. Hi. Morning, Jackson said to her. He now felt awkward with the bag in his hand, knowing what was in it. We got a bag of yours by mistake. Katie flushed and looked at the floor. I have one of yours at home. I could bring it to your mom's book club later, but I'm not sure if I'll make it there yet. I plan on looking for my keys after work. I got your keys this morning. Jackson held out the keys and the bag. I figured you might be working, so I took it upon myself to go digging for them. Thank you. Katie came closer, accepting the bag and keys with relief. Jackson, you have no idea how much I appreciate this. Jackson shrugged, downplaying his part in rescuing Katie yet again. He and Trent had done it so many times over the years, it wasn't really anything special anymore. I would have brought the car here, but I didn't think I would fit in it since it's so small. My knees would hit the ceiling if I managed to fold myself in. It's okay. I'll get one of the girls to give me a ride to the grocery store after work. Katie smiled happily, and Jackson felt a little breathless as she looked up at him. Thank you so much. You're welcome, he said gruffly. I better get back to work. They said their goodbyes, and Jackson thought hard as he walked back to his truck in the parking lot. Just who was Katie involved with? In a town this size, people tended to know each other's business, sometimes before they knew it themselves. Yet he didn't remember anyone mentioning that Katie was seeing someone. When his mom had speculated about it last night with him, she didn't have any answers either. Whoever he was, he had better step up and be good to her, Jackson thought as he started the truck and made his way back to the center of town. Katie's beau needed to take responsibility, especially if there was a little one on the way. Jackson supposed he could leave it to his mother to pry when Katie came to her book club. Donna would get down to the bottom of this. She had a knack for getting Katie to confide in her. Pulling into the parking lot, Jackson noted that the downtown core was full today. People were running errands. He supposed if Ginny was right. Soon the downtown area would sport even more empty places than what it already did, as businesses closed when the local population decreased. In the hardware store, affectionately known as the tool shed, Jackson wandered down an aisle, trying to find a seal for his snowblower before the winter weather came in earnest. He needed to get it fixed, because he had no liking for the thought of shoveling the long farm lane by hand. Up by the counter, a group of men were congregated, talking about the shutdown of Hawkins Fine Furniture Company. Neil McFadden was defending the Hawkins family. I don't believe that they're holding any money back. Brent and Owen have been pinching pennies for years to keep the company going. How is it right that they get to keep that big farm of theirs while everyone else is cheated out of their severance packages? Dwayne Tool said belligerently. Jackson didn't much like Dwayne. He was a bit of a know-it-all and was never shy about sharing his opinion, which was usually angry and negative. That farm has been in their family for centuries, Calvin Dayton remarked. I saw Rod Temple's truck out there this morning when I drove by. Do you think it's going up for auction? Neil asked curiously. What do you care? Duane responded. You're going to the big city with a new job. It's an interview? Neil replied a little testily to Duane. I haven't got the job yet. Gentlemen, Jackson walked past them to the counter, where old Rick Guile was waiting, sipping a coffee. Jackson handed the seal to Rick. Seems like people here have a lot of time on their hands to be talking rather than working. That they do, Rick readily agreed, ringing up the purchase. Need a bag? No, that's fine. Jackson paid and grabbed the seal. You have a good day. As he left, he could hear the talk pick back up again. Now that Jackson knew that the Hawkins factory was closing for certain, he decided to grab a case of beer at the corner store. Someone would have to commiserate with Brant, and Jackson had an idea of where his friend might be. Brant had worked at the family business his entire life. He was a partner in the company and in charge of the second shift. He loved his job and had worked hard to make the company successful through online custom orders. Brant had confided in Jackson, 
that while it was slow, their online presence had been increasing, and he felt that if the company could just keep afloat for the next five years or so, they might finally start to drag Hawkins Fine Furniture out of the red. It had been a change and a gamble going into custom furniture, rather than just assembling line furniture to big box stores. But Brandt had convinced his father Owen after their orders had dropped drastically from their usual customers. Now Brandt would never know if his plan would work. Something had happened which had caused them to close. Perhaps it had just been too late to make the scheme work. Jackson knew his friend would be upset over the closing of the business. Just as he thought, he found Brandt at the local pond, fishing. It was late in the season, and he probably wouldn't even get a bite, but fishing was a relaxing activity. Grabbing the beer and his own pole from his truck, Jackson trusted that Brandt would have bait enough for both of them, especially if they didn't get any nibbles. He set the case on the grass, handing a bottle to Brandt who took it without comment. Jackson baited and cast his line before grabbing a beer for himself. They fished in companionable silence for a while. "'Suppose you heard,' commented Brant. "'Hard not to. It's all over town,' replied Jackson, enjoying the peace of the water, trees, and birds. "'Banks seized the property. They've taken the farm, too,' grimaced Brant. Jackson gave his friend a sharp look. "'You're not serious.' Ted serious, Brant confirmed grimly. We mortgaged, then mortgaged again, even after the grandparents mortgaged to keep the factory going. Three mortgages and too many missed payments, along with operating loans from both the farm and business. The bank owns them both now. Thankfully, they've given us until tomorrow noon to get moved out. I'm sorry, Brant. Jackson couldn't think of what else to say. The Hawkins had lost everything, trying to keep their business open for the benefit of the community. Two hundred jobs lost, sighed Brant. There was a look of defeat in his eyes. Pendle will never recover. Give it a year and there'll be no town, just empty buildings. Where is your family going to go? Quietly asked Jackson. Where are they going to live until they figure things out? Mabel Talbot offered us Ma Benson's place rent-free for three months. Brant pulled in his line, then cast again, just for something to do. I decided to take the afternoon to sulk. Tonight I'll help pack things up, and tomorrow we move everything from the house. All the equipment and anything left behind will be auctioned off for the bank. After my parents have moved, I'll have to search for a job. If you need anything, let me know. Jackson made the offer, genuinely wanting to help. Thanks. Brad acknowledged the offer with a nod. Sarah Lee's coming back home to help. She lost her job, too. We are a sad bunch right now. Sarah Lee was Brant's sister. She hated being called Sarah Lee, and mostly everyone acquiesced to her request to be called Sarah. Sarah had been a big city tabloid reporter, writing under the name Sterling Denver, for the tabloid Dubious. You'll be leaving Pendle, too, then. Jackson knew that his friend would need a job, and there weren't any here. Who will pitch for the team? Brant knew that was Jackson's way of saying that he would be missed. He tamped down his own emotions as he looked over the water. Don't think there will be a team. Not if everyone leaves. His friend was probably right, Jackson mused to himself. It was a sad day in Pendle. How do you manage? Brant asked suddenly. You have the farm still going. Most people are losing ground each year. Are you staying out of the red? I manage by the skin of my teeth. Jackson responded lightly. If he didn't have the additional income, he wouldn't manage at all. It helps that we aren't mortgaged, so it's the only the operating loans that we have to try to pay back each year. I think that was the biggest problem, Brant murmured as he stared out over the waters. I ran the numbers a few times. If we hadn't had such a huge debt over us, the plant would have been profitable. Not by much, but enough to keep everything afloat. That had to suck, knowing that the accounting would work if only for the bank's demands. Jackson let his silence be his answer. There was nothing he could say to that. Brant gave a bitter laugh. We were done before they even tried. Gramps got that loan. He wanted to expand the factory, and he did took on far too much debt, got far too big, and saddled us with the impossible. I loved that man. 
but that was the worst business decision he ever made, and we suffered for it. Pendle suffered for it. Ever since I was a little kid, I was brought up knowing that the Hawkins have been the founders of this town, that we were responsible for Pendle and its citizens. Brant said woodenly, This is our legacy. You're not responsible, Jackson responded, not liking the turn of the conversation. No one man can be responsible for everyone else. Brant just looked at Jackson with hollow eyes. This was my turn. The dead town is the legacy I'm leaving behind. Jackson didn't know what to say. Katie couldn't believe it. The daycare had been buzzing all about the news of Hawkins Factory shutting down all day. The rumors were true that the factory was done. If the largest employer in town was done, then it was only a matter of time before the daycare closed and Katie was out of a job. The reality of her situation was Katie lived paycheck to paycheck. She had no idea what she was going to do, short of moving back with her parents until she had enough for first and last rent plus a new job. Getting a ride to the grocery store with a friend from work, Katie reclaimed her car. Sighing with relief when it started on the first try, Katie drove home. Once safely there, she eyed the gas gauge. It was on empty, edging toward fumes. With her practice eye, Katie estimated she could make it to the Davis Farm for Book Club and back home before it became critical. She would have to put in some gas tomorrow after work. Digging in her purse, all she had was five dollars. It would have to do until she was paid tomorrow. The car would also do with some more oil, but that would wait as well. With a shrug, Katie got out of the car and made her way to Sylvie's door. Sylvie answered it immediately. Did you hear? How could I not? Katie handed Sylvie her pregnancy kit. It's all over town. Sylvie ushered Katie inside. The television was on as two boys watched it. Her daughters were coloring on the living room coffee table. Thank you. What does Neil think about the possibility of another baby? Katie shed her jacket, putting it over a kitchen chair. He thinks babies are great. The problem is he doesn't have to birth them or balance the checkbook. Sylvie rolled her eyes as she grabbed the kettle to put on tea. Katie got the mugs and sugar out. Do you have cookies? Don't say that word here. Sylvie looked furtively into the living room. They have ears and will steal away from my snash if they find out where it is. Plus, they had their quota of food before dinner. With a smile, Katie sat at the table while her friend placed a couple of cookies for each of them under a napkin on the table to hide the treats from the children. Sylvie poured the tea and took a seat. Sarah Lee is back in town, Sylvie commented. Neil saw her at the factory today as the family handed out final pay. I suppose we should say hi, Katie blew on her hot mug. Why? Sylvie didn't particularly like the youngest Hawkins. She was always trying to get out of this town. We weren't good enough for her. I don't think it was quite like that, reasoned Katie. I think she just wanted more than Pendle could offer. She wanted to be a journalist, remember? It's not like you can be a journalist in Pendle. There's nothing to write about except farm prices and who won what hockey tournament. That's why our newspaper's only released once a month. Katie thought sometimes that the news was so old in the paper. The only reason any of the copies sold was community loyalty to the one-person team who still produced the Pendle periodical. Instead, she became some big tabloid writer, Sylvie said in disgust. At least she pursued her dreams, Katie said wistfully. Truly, what dream did you ever want and not get? The ability to pay the bills, have a vacation each year, and maintain a savings account for retirement and college funds, Sylvie responded with a practical tone. She sneaked a cookie after checking the kids were otherwise occupied. Quickly dunking it, she took a bite. What about you? I wanted to open my own daycare, confided Katie. Barring that, I wanted to be a farm wife with five kids and a really nice kitchen. Not exactly big dreams in this part of the country. What does Jackson Davis's kitchen look like? Sylvie teased her friend. Katie snitched a cookie. It's lovely. The kitchen, dining area, and living room are all open concept. There's a big fireplace and a large glass doors to the deck. I will get to see it tonight. It's Donna's turn to host the book club. 
You could come and see it for yourself. No, thanks. You know me. I'd rather wait for the movie than read a book. Sylvie went for her second cookie. Maybe you could flirt with Jackson tonight. Flutter your lashes at him. I did that once, shuddered Katie. He asked me if there was something in my eye. I ended up flushing my eye with water because I was too embarrassed to admit there wasn't anything there. Then I looked like a demented raccoon for the rest of the day because my mascara ran. Oh, Katie, laughed Sylvie. Did you know that you can get copies of my ebooks, paperbacks, and even audiobooks on Amazon? Just type in Josephine Bintema and you'll find all of them there.